Fine. So um, for today's class, I want to delve into the period that we're in. As mentioned, this is a period of the counting of the Omer between Passover and Shavuot. It's a period of self-introspection. And up until Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, uh, which falls, by the way, next Thursday night and Friday, it is also a period of mourning. Uh, some prolong that period of mourning and they go beyond Lagba Omer, some end that on Lagba Omer. But I want to focus on the spirit, not just to understand what it is, but most importantly, to maybe draw life lessons from uh, the meaning of the spirit, both the mourning side and also the counting side. So I'm going to share my screen as always. And we'll dive right into these references. So let's go to the very heart of the spirit. And the reason of why we mourn up until Lagba Omer, up until the 33rd day of the Omer. The reason is found right here in the Babylonian Talmud. Does anyone want to read? Rabbi Akiva. Anyone? All you have to do is unmute yourself. <laughs> I'll read. Oh, please. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Go Rabbi ahead. Akiva we'll save the day. Had 12,000 pairs of disciples, all of whom perished within a short period because they did not treat each other with respect. Rav Chama ben Abba said, Some attribute this saying to Rabbi Chia ben Avin, they suffered a cruel death. What was it? Rav Nachman replied, Krup. Krup, that had no cure back in the day. We're speaking about <clears throat> about 2,000 years ago, maybe a little less than that. And they all died in the plague. Now imagine 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, the legendary Rabbi Akiva. Imagine just one aspect of it. And that is how larger the Jewish library would be today if those 24,000 students had survived. Because obviously they all, Rabbi Akiva, his students wrote many, many books. They are an integral part of the Talmud. So of course the Talmud would be, would be much thicker today if they had survived. And just, that's just one contribution. And um, certainly the contribution for their own descendants would have uh, also enlarged the Jewish world, not just in quantity, but also I'm sure in quality. So of course, this is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Now, as uh, Julie just read, when the Talmudic sages try to grapple with this terrible plague, they ask themselves, well, why did this, why did this happen? And not that there is an answer for the why of death, uh, I don't think any death can ever be explained and can ever be reasoned with. But I think what they are really asking is what lesson can we learn from this? Something happened and we have to learn from everything in life and certainly from the things that are most challenging. So what can we learn from this? And their answer, as you just read, Julie, is because they don't treat each other with respect. Maybe from this point on, they were saying, we have to try and treat each other with respect. I wanna go back to that first. Uh, I want to go back to that just a little bit later, but first really dwell on this period of mourning that again commemorates the passing of those 12,000 pairs of disciples. And practically speaking, we see that Jewish law has uh, customs and rules of what we should do during the spirit or what we should not do to mourn this terrible tragedy. So let's, let's just read about these uh, customs and then we can develop this idea of respect which is the lesson that they drew from this tragedy. Does anyone want to read again? That really wants to continue. Does anyone want to read here what the customs are for this period? Code of Jewish law. Please, Janet, go for it. <clears throat> Code of Jewish law. Some of the following activities are curtailed during the mourning period of the Omar. Marriages and wedding celebrations. It is permitted, however, to become engaged to marry during this time. Cutting of one's hair. Cutting is something, hair cutting is sometimes permitted under accentuating circumstances related to life cycle celebrations or professional reasons that make it necessary to do so. Right. Listening to instrumental music, unless this is one's livelihood. Purchasing and wearing new garments gar that bring joy due to their quality, a new dress, suit, or dress shoes, if one requires such garments for business purposes or because one is meeting a new person with an eye to find a marriage partner and needs to make a good impression, it's permissible. Right. Okay. So that's one of the examples. By the way, these morning customs uh, also exist when, God forbid, a relative of ours, an immediate relative of ours passes on. Uh, those are some of the morning customs. 
But again, we mourn collectively as a nation, these 24,000 deaths. And this is uh, some ways in which we mourn. But I want to go back now to the very, very uh, part of the story, which I believe is the lesson that the sages take from this terrible tragedy. And as mentioned, they took the lesson that we ought to respect each other more. And maybe this tremendous disrespect that existed among those 24,000 students is what eventually caused them uh, to deteriorate into some sort of death. Now, it's interesting to note, before we even go into this lesson of respect, that Rabbi Akiva was known for teaching that to love your fellow as yourself is the greatest rule in the Torah. And the question therefore jumps and, uh, and poses itself because these were the students of Rabbi Akiva who passed. And Rabbi Akiva is the one who taught that you should love your fellow so you couldn't respect one another. They didn't treat each other with respect. You, can, you can't listen to what your own teacher tells you to do, to love your fellow as yourself. But the answer, friends, I believe is in the differentiation between respect and love. It's two separate emotions. And I know we've spoken a little bit about this before. But to emphasize this point, love is almost the opposite of respect, as respect is the opposite of love. When I love someone, I want to come close to them. I want to hug them. I want to be with them. When I respect someone, I actually want to draw a little distance between me and the person I respect. There's this awe I feel towards this person. So if you think about this, love and respect are two opposite emotions, or they at least create two opposite reactions. What is the ultimate type of relationship? The ultimate type of relationship is when I can love, like Rabbi Akiva taught, but I don't love too much. I also know how to restrain my love with respect. And that means that I also know when to back off, when to allow the person to be, or when to give space to the other. You know, it's interesting because Queen Elizabeth was married for 73 years to King Philip, who just passed, as you all know, from all the tabloids and news. But um, uh, she was interviewed and she was asked, what, what do you attribute the success of your marriage to? 73 years, just imagine. And she said that they knew how to give each other space. Like Philip knew how to give his wife some space, especially that she was a queen. And so did she know how to give him some space. And I, it hit me because I think that in our day and age, we have a lot of love. Yes, we want to kiss, we want to hug, and we want to even suffocate the other with love. What about respect? What about allowing the other to be? What about embracing not just the other, but also the differences in the other and allowing the person to, to actualize his differences or his uniqueness, we don't have too much of that in our society. And yet comes again, the, the Talmud learning from this period of time that we're in right now and saying, well, maybe what the most important thing element in relationships is, is respect, not so much love. Yes, Rabbi Akiva was right to teach about love, but what we need most, especially in our day and age, is this respect, allowing the other again to be. Now, how can one do so? Let's, let's dive into this even further. Let's, let's dig into this, this big idea of respect. How can I truly uh, feel respect for others when the others really don't do anything to be respectable? What, what, how, can, how can I really have a relationship in which I, I am told to respect someone that doesn't even respect themselves? And for that, I think we have to dig deeper into the custom or the, even the mitzvah of the period of the Omer, which is the period we're in, as mentioned. And that is the mitzvah of counting. Because during this period of time, not only do we mourn the deaths of Rabbi Akiva, of the students of Rabbi Akiva, as mentioned, but we also count each and every day. Now, the simple reason of why we count each and every day, uh, the days between Passover and Shavuot, is to show our anticipation for Shavuot which is the day in which God gave us the Torah on Mount Sinai. So we anticipate the re-giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai on Shavuot each and every year, and therefore we count. Just like my kids right now are counting the days until the summer vacation. So they anticipated so much that they're counting and counting. So to a year we count it. But the deeper reason really stems from the word usfartem, to count, or in the words of the, the uh, Torah itself is you shall count for yourself in Leviticus. It's interesting to note that the word for counting in Hebrew also means to eliminate. 
Usfartem comes from the word sapir. Sapir is sapphire. And sapphire is a uh, you know, jewel of, of light. And that is because uh, God is telling us that during this time, we should not only count the days, but we should illuminate the days. Or more importantly, we should illuminate not just the days, but we should illuminate for you, as it says in the verse right here. For you, you should illuminate you and you should illuminate the other. What does it mean to illuminate the other? What it means is that when I illuminate the other, I recognize that the other is unique and that the other has a light that only he or she can shine. There is a mission given to each and every individual that is unlike the mission of the other, that is entirely unique to the individual himself or herself. Every human being is very, very different. We're different, not just physically, of course, but we're different spiritually speaking. We have a unique mission that only we can fulfill or note, so to speak, that only we can play. And when we are counting for you, what we are trying to do during the spirit is recognize how unique every human being is and how indispensable they are, how the uniqueness is indispensable to the greater collective of humanity, to the greater symphony, so to speak. That's how we can respect one another. Yes, yeah, sometimes people don't even respect themselves and we ask ourselves, well, why respect them? Sometimes people do nothing for them to be respected. But still, we have to believe that deep within that person that doesn't even respect him or herself, deep within that person is a unique calling. There's a unique mission. And I ought to have res some respect at least towards that uniqueness in the other, towards that unique mission. And at, I ought to have uh, this respect at least towards the idea that without this person, the greater symphony of, our, of humanity is incomplete, is missing a note. And that's how we can truly respect one another. So I believe that the counting of the Omer and this tragedy that speaks of respect uh, complement one another because we can only truly respect another if we recognize the uniqueness in the other and the unique mission that the other possesses. And once we can recognize that, then it's much easier to respect the other. And this is why Rabbi Menachem, and I want to maybe share a story about this, but Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgan of Morgenstern of Kotsk, also known as the Kotsk Rebbe, would say, and I don't know if we've quoted this in the past before, but he would say, if I am I because I am I, and you are you because you are you, then I am and you are you. In other words, that we can live in harmony. If I am being me and you are being you, then we can live in harmony. But if I am I just because you are you, in other words, I'm trying to emulate you. And you are you because I am I, and you try to emulate me, and no one is really being true to their uniqueness, then I am not, and you are not. And I am not I, and you are not you. And it's one of the most powerful verses, I, or quotes at least, because I really believe that it's key to the success, not just of an individual to fulfill his unique mission, but I think it's key to the success of humanity. If everyone recognizes that they are unique and that they have a note that only they can play as mentioned, then, the, then humanity can act one li one, like one big harmonious symphony. You know, I um, put Rabbi Steinsaltz a lot, especially since he's passing. Next week will be exactly nine months since Rabbi Steinsaltz passed. But I'll never forget how he walked into a high school uh, class one day. I learned in his, I had the privilege of learning in his high school, the Mekorchaim, High school that uh, today is in Kfar Etzion, just outside of Israel, but of uh, Jerusalem. My times it was in Jerusalem, but I remember that he once walked into um, our class, and we were <laughs> we were uh, uh, a class with some uh, created some disturbances to say the least, and uh, he wanted to shake us up, so he came into the class. And he asked us the question, what do you think it is that I want from the students here in my, my school? So everyone offered different answers and he of course canceled them all. And then he said, I'll tell you what I want. I want everyone to look into the mirror. I'll never forget it. I want everyone to look into the mirror each and every day and ask themselves, who am I meant to be? Not who am I, but who am I meant to be? That's what I wanna do. And if I had the power, he added, 
I would bring a huge mirror to every classroom so that everyone can ask themselves that question. But I'm afraid he would, he concluded that I'm afraid that this mirror will make you think all sorts of other thoughts that will take away then from the thought of who I meant to be. But that's what I want to achieve. And I thought it was one really, one of the most powerful lines and certainly lines of education that I ever heard from my beloved rabbi. Because I think that's the goal of humanity. It's the goal of each and every one of us here on this call and all the listeners and every human being again on this planet is to ask themselves as they are looking to, at themselves in the mirror, who am I meant to be? And, and what I am meant to be is not what the other is meant to be. It's something that's unique again, just to me. And that's what respect truly means. You know, in Hebrew, there is no word for tolerance. We, we don't believe in tolerance in Judaism. And therefore, there's no Hebrew word for it because tolerance means that I'll just fine. I don't like what you're about, but I'll, I'll tolerate you. In Judaism, we like what you're about. And not only that, we like the different person that you are. We like the uniqueness in you. So we don't tolerate you. We embrace you. We encourage you to be you. That's why, again, tolerance is not a Jewish notion. We go much further. Respect comes, comes from an active encouragement to myself and to the other to be unique, to be that person that we are meant to be. And that, I think, is one of the main lessons from this Omni period. I want to open this up. I feel like I'm monologuing here. And then we can go to uh, lesson two. But does anyone want to share anything? Ideas? Disagreement? No one. Oh, come on. Okay. Fine. All right. Good. I mean, you can unmute yourself. And even while I'm speaking, you can ask a question or share an idea or thought or whatever it may be. But if there's nothing to be said, so we'll continue to tool number two. And that is also based on this verse, Leviticus 23, 15, that you should count for yourselves from the day of the Shabbat, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. So we count seven complete weeks. And each and every week is counted not just as a week, but also as seven days. Every day is counted separately. Now, we already spoke about this commentary of Rabbi Shnoh Zaman Vladi that says that to count here does not just refer to the counting of each and every day, but also to, it also means to illuminate. So we said one commentary is that we illuminate human beings, individuals, and the uniqueness. The other lesson I want to draw from this verse is not the not lesson of illuminating individuals, but the lesson of illuminating time. I was just forwarded last, um, a few days ago, or maybe it was, yeah, just a few days ago, a video of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Shneerson of Blessed Memory, who uh, shouted, you can hear the shout in his voice, about how when a person should look, when, when a person looks at a clock, when a person looks at his watch, I mean, I don't wear a watch, I don't think many people wear watches anymore, we have this little crazy device that we use instead of watches, but when a person looks at a clock, a watch, a cell phone, or whatever it may be that shows the time, it should shake him to the core. Why? Because we see that there's another second going by, another tick to the clock, another moment flying by, and we must ask, it must shake us to the point that we ask the question, what are we doing with this time? Are we wasting it? Are we allowing it to squander? Are we truly actualizing the time that God is giving us? Because that time will truly never come back. What are we doing with this time? A clock should be a wake-up call to each and every human being. And I think it connects to this riddling question. But imagine, does anyone want to read the riddling question? Anyone? Go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. I see you raising your hand. Go ahead. Yes. A, rid a riddling question. Imagine there is a bank which credits your account each morning with $86,400 carries over no balance from day to day, allows you to keep no cash balance, and every evening cancels whatever part of the amount you had failed to use during the day, what would you do? Right, so it's not like uh, cell phone plans. You don't have rollover minutes. You can't, you can't roll over the money uh, of, that is left from your 86,400. What do you do? It's a famous riddle out there. And uh, really, it's not a riddle because this bank does exist. And it's called the bank of time. Every day, God gives us 86,400 seconds. 
And whatever we use, we use. Whatever we don't use doesn't roll over to the next day. Otherwise, we'd be living up until 700 years old. But it doesn't work that way. So the question is, what do we do with that time, with that valuable time, with this money of 86,400, which is time money, not currency, but time money? And that's a question that really is, needs to be posed during this, this time period. They say that to realize truly, why don't you read the next Quote right here, great quote too. Uh, by the unknown author? Yeah, exactly. To realize the value of one minute, ask a person who missed the train. To realize the value of one second, ask a person who just avoided an accident. To realize the value of one millisecond, ask the person who won a silver medal in the Olympics. <laughs> right, exactly. Maybe that puts a good perspective on what time truly is about. But indeed, this is what this verse comes to teach us, that every moment is so dear. The problem is that we either live in the past too much and are shackled by it, or live in the illusion of the future, even though it hasn't happened yet. But yes, Janet, please. I see you raising your hand. So how, how does one like really keep this, what, you're, what we're just discussing in the present? Like, it all sounds great, it's all correct, it all makes sense. And I find myself so often looking at my children who are adults and I'm like, when did they grow up? Where did the time go? I'm always finding myself saying, I blink, you know, she was three and I blink, she's 35, you know? And how do you, I, I get it. And I, all I can do with that information is I have a granddaughter and I tell my daughter, you know, please, you're gonna blink, she's gonna grow up. Enjoy every day, enjoy every minute, enjoy every second. But yet I find my, you know, like I still don't take advantage of every second. How do you get right. into that, you know? Right, no, it's what true. What can help, what can help, I guess, me or thing. anyone? Yeah, yeah, blink. good question. Yeah, Jackie, go for it, yeah. No, no, I do the same with my, my daughter and yeah. my son. Yeah. I can't believe tomorrow my grandson's going to be five. It's like, where does time go? Yeah, and yeah. I live every day. But... Mazel tov to your grandson. Uh, yeah, I remember his bris. <laughs> it's true. Time flies. And I don't think there's a way, frankly, I don't think there's a way to eliminate that, that feeling. I think everyone will feel that way as time goes by. I mean, I feel that way too with my children. And my oldest is 20 years old and wow, I still remember his breast too. It's like, where has the time gone by? Uh, but I, I do think that the, the, there is two ways of looking of the, at that time flying, flying by. One way is to look at it with at least some sort of satisfaction. Mm. Okay, so my yeah. son is 20 years old, but I'm satisfied uh, for the times that we did spend together, the quality times that we did have, and also for the person he's become maybe a little bit thanks to my education, a little bit, ready a little bit. And um, that's one way. A second way is to say, gosh, the time has, has gone by so quickly and I'm full of regrets. And I say to myself, I didn't use the time correctly. And I, I missed the boat here. My son is, is disconnected from me because I missed the boat. There's two ways of looking at it. Um, I think that if we squander time, then we'll end up looking at the time flying by with, with those second lenses, unfortunately. But I think if we actualize the time and we try to make the best of it, then yes, we'll always feel like, oh, the time has gone by and there wasn't enough of it. But at least we'll have some sort of some, some, some uh, you know, taste of satisfaction as we look at it. So I don't think there's a way to eliminate this feeling altogether. It's just a question of which type of feeling we'll have when we look at that time that has flown by. Yes, Janet. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, I mean, I know that that's a natural feeling of time going by and I'm fine with that. But I, I guess what I'm saying is what, what advice or how can I right. try to utilize every, in other words, I, I don't, yeah, I have regrets. I don't have regrets. And it's not that so much. It's more about what kind of tool to right. use to 
really, really use the time every right. single second that's right. going by. And I do want to go into that. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, that's an excellent question. I think the most important is really to understand the power in the now. You know, maybe to, to elaborate or to, to, to explain this better, I'll use the anecdote of Rabbi Steinsaltz. Once again, my beloved rabbi, I once asked him, what is your favorite book? He's written many, many books, not just these commentaries on the Talmud and the Bible, etc., but also actual books on Jewish thought and social criticism. Is it some 70 books. So what's your favorite book? And his reply stuck to me because it answers this question that you're asking, Janet. And that is, his reply was also, what's your favorite book? He said, my favorite book is the one I'm working on right now. <laughs> now, um, it taught me volumes about how to live life and how to treat time. Yes, I may have written 20 books, or so he wrote like 60 books by that point on, by that point. But he doesn't look back. And those books may have been better than the one he was writing right now at that moment. Maybe yes, maybe no, who's to say? But he was focused on the now. The moment I have right now is the most important moment in the world. And I think that helps a lot um, guide a person towards cherishing time, and not just cherishing time, but also actualizing the time that we have that will never come back. So I think that's tool number one. Tool number two, I think maybe it's the most important of the two tools, okay, living the power of now. But tool number two is the way we not just, we, we don't just view time, but I think it's the way we view ourselves. And I learned this from Joseph, and we may have mentioned this in the past, but Joseph, the biblical Joseph, who was maybe the most abused man in history, right? His brothers tried to kill him, threw him into a pit full of snakes and scorpions. If that's not abuse, then what is? Then they took him out of their pit and they sold him to slavery. If that's not abuse, then what is? Then in slavery, he was accused of rape, even though he had nothing to do with it. If that's not abuse, what is? Then he was thrown into an Egyptian dungeon. If that's not abuse, what is? Finally, he became the vice king, and the brothers who had tried to murder him come down to Egypt and they don't recognize him. They have these encounters. And Joseph eventually decides to reveal himself. And he says to them, I am Joseph. Ani Yosef, is my father stole alive. And they don't know what to do with themselves. They are sure that now that Joseph is the vice king, he's going to take his revenge. And Joseph immediately tells them, don't be afraid. And it's one of my favorite verses in the entire Torah. And he says to them, because you think you sold me here? No, no, you did not sell me here. God sent me here. I wasn't sold, I was sent. And Joseph is sharing, I think, one of the great secrets of life and one of the great secrets of how to truly actualize time. You can view yourself as being sold, right? As being a victim. And it's always the other person's fault and there's the whole world to blame. Or you can view yourself as being sent, that even in the, cha the challenges that you're experiencing are really missions of, for you to accomplish. And you are God's ambassador to this world. And when you view yourself as an ambassador, I think then you view every moment, no matter whether it's a moment of challenge or a moment of joy, but you view every moment as a moment in which you have a mission to accomplish. And when you can view yourself as an ambassador, and view every moment as a moment in which you have a mission to accomplish, then I don't think much time can be squandered. Because right now I have something to do. I'm not gonna just sit back in the, in the pool and do nothing. I mean, yes, vacation is necessary from time to time to rejuvenate ourselves, but that's not the goal of life. We're not gonna just squander time because we're ambassadors. Ambassadors have missions in every moment. So I think these are two massive tools. One is to appreciate the power of now now is all we have. The book I'm working on is the most important book, so to speak, right? To use Rabbi Stanz's story. Another one is to view ourselves, not just time, not just the, the now, but to view ourselves as ambassadors. And if we can view ourselves as God's ambassadors to every moment, then we treat time differently. Good point. Good question. Okay. Um, I want to go to tool, I don't know why it says tool four, but it's tool three. Tool three right here, and that's be like a read. And this is, I spoke about one of my favorite verses in the Torah. This is one of my favorite passages in the Talmud. Does anyone want to read? The rabbi is taught, a person should always be. 
Please, Julie, go for it, continue. Uh, the rabbis taught a person should always be as flexible as the reed and let him never be hard as the cedar. Okay, all right. What does that mean? What this means is that a reed, even though it's, it's thin and it's flexible and it moves with the wind, when a storm comes, it cannot be uprooted. Even a hurricane, even a hurricane strength five cannot be up, uprooted. Cedar trees, even though they seem so muscular and big and, and powerful, with a little storm, even a tropical storm, I believe, or maybe hurricane category one or two, they're easily uprooted. And why is that? Because again, a person with a, that is like a reed is a person that has understood very, two very important secrets in life. Secret number one is that you have to be rooted like a reed. You have to be anchored in values and principles in your heritage and who you are, as we mentioned. But also the reed understood that being flexible, that you don't have to pick every fight, that you can make the difference between what is truly important and what is trivial. If you're as flexible as the reed, then you'll be able also to withstand the storms of life. But if you're a cedar tree that fights every fight, and then again, um, thinks that it's all powerful and needs to exercise its power all the time, then you'll eventually collapse. And in a way, this is the story of Rabbi Akiva, who we mentioned, who takes uh, the center stage of this Omer period. But uh, Rabbi Akiva once spoke of a near-death experience that he had. Does anyone want to continue to read the story here? Anyone? I was once traveling on a ship. Uh, Julie, go for it. Continue. Thank you. I was once traveling on a ship, recounted the second century great sage and leader of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, Rabban Gamliel. When I saw another ship that had been wrecked, my heart grieved, especially for one of its passengers, the Torah sage Rabbi Akiva. When I reached land and resumed my studies, I saw him sitting before me and discussing halakhic matters with me. When Rabban Gamliel inquired as to who had rescued him from the sea, Rabbi Akiva replied, aboard from the ship came my way and I clung to it. With each wave we came, when each wave came surging towards me, I bowed my head, letting it pass over me. Right. And eventually he was uh, rescu uh, rescued. But <clears throat> I think that this simple act, which was an act of survival, uh, of course, is, uh, is taught in the Talmud because it also teaches us one of the most important life lessons. And that sometimes when a wave comes to you, all you have to do is bow your head a little bit. Be a little flexible like a reed. Uh, be humble. Exercise some uh, modesty. And in a way, I think that um, will make those waves pass by and you'll be able to survive those storms. I think that uh, part of the curse of social media is that we feel like every post, every 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 news needs to be posted and every post needs to be liked or disliked, uh, spoken about and, uh, and so on and so forth. And we see that on Twitter all the time. We see that on Facebook all the time. We see that on Instagram. And we see that on all those social media platforms as if everything is worthy. And here Rabbi Akiva tells us, no, not everything is worthy. But by your head, you don't like some news. Okay, so you let it pass. Someone uh, shared a knee jerk reaction with you. You let it pass. So what? You, you, you got insulted, you let it pass, you move on. And maybe Janet, I wanna relate this maybe to one of the, as, as one of the answers to your question before. And that is maybe that's also another way we can truly appreciate time and actualize the moment. Because if we waste our time trying to fight all these stupid fights and trying to post all these stupid posts mm -hmm. and trying to be, be completely, uh, allow our hearts and our mind to be completely conquered by all sorts of negativities, we'll never be able to live life. And yeah, I think that's, that's the third most important rule here of the Omen period. In order to achieve respect, in order to be like Rabbi Akiva, again, takes the center stage of this period. We too ought to act like him and to know that not every fight is worth fighting. And sometimes, yes, we might face opposition, but uh, our bow of the head will ensure that we survive and that we come, uh, come out on the, other, on the other end, strong and powerful. And I wanna, you know, Maybe we'll finish with this, with this uh, little story about uh, General MacArthur, but I, I do want to mention, um, since Yom HaShoah was just, what, two weeks ago, I want to mention uh, a powerful lesson that I once 
learned from a Holocaust survivor who lived in Israel and we had, going back to my high school years again, we had the privilege of meeting him. His name was Ruven Avigdor. And uh, he told his story to the entire the high school yeshiva of how he survived Auschwitz and I won't go into the details. But one of the things he said is that um, one thing he learned in Auschwitz that he took with him for the rest of his life. And that was how to be as flexible as a reed, quoting that passage from the Talmud. Where did he learn that from? He learned that from the torturous days that he experienced in Auschwitz, because the Nazis would treat them as dogs or worse than dogs, as we all know. And he said to himself that he immediately noticed that there were two types of, of Jews, two types of inmates. One type was a type that took those insults of the Nazis and those beatings of the Nazis to heart. Sometimes they try to fight against it and sometimes they just went home completely de or to the barracks, what home? To the barracks, completely depressed and despondent. And there was another type who said to themselves from the get-go, yes, they will treat us like animals. Yes, they'll do everything to humiliate us and beat us down, but we will keep our head up high. We won't let this get to us. We'll be flexible. We'll Again, like Rabbi Akiva, bow our head and let it slide. And those people are the ones who were much stronger, who eventually really were able to, to in a way withstand all of this unfathomable torture. And that's what he took with him to life. This Ruven Avigdor tells us, in life I understood that not every time someone shouts at me, that was a lesson I, that us as high school students really needed to, to hear. Not, everyone sh sometime, not ev every time someone shouts at me, I have to respond. Not only do I not have to respond, I have to take it to heart. Not every time a business deal doesn't work for me, I go crazy and I go ballistic. So what? All right, so I'll let it slide, I'll buy my head. And it's one of the great lessons he learned from the Nazis themselves and from his experience at Auschwitz. I'm saying to myself, if a Holocaust survivor can learn this lesson uh, from, from these, again, unthinkable, torturous days, then even more so we ought to learn these lessons. Thank God we don't have to go through these torture, uh, torturous days, but, but it's still a lesson that, that must, must be taken to heart. And um, the same lesson was conveyed in the words here of General MacArthur, and maybe we'll conclude with that. Julie, you wanna finish sure. your reading here with just one more. Sure. Once General Douglas MacArthur instructed his soldiers to move backward from the front, Someone asked him, have we been defeated? Are we retreating? And he said, we are not retreating. We are advancing in another direction. That's right. Interesting. Exactly. And sometimes that's the way we have to view these oppositions. Now, no, they're not causing us to retreat. We're just choosing a different direction, a direction which will enable us to stay strong and to be, um, uh, to stay strong like Ruven Avigdor and to be, um, uh, uh, um, wise and uh, to recognize the difference between what is important and what is trivial so that we can truly actualize our purpose in life, our individual purpose in life and actualize the time that we are given and at the same time also actualize the calling of our soul at every single moment in our life.